Hello everyone, my name is River and welcome to the Nimiton. Today we have something quite special. I would like to introduce, if you have not known him, and if you don't, that's kind of a failing on your part, a Mr. Lon Milo Duquette. He is very well known, especially in the Thelemic community. Uh, and the reason we're here to talk today is because he has a text and it's known as Chicken Cobbler. And there's an extension to this text, but specifically on Chicken Cobbler, it, it's an expression of understanding the hermetic style of the Kabbalah, but it utilizes and mixes in the Jewish aspects. It's something that really caught me off guard. I actually discovered this book slightly after Zohar, and it, it impressed me a lot. And for those who don't know, Mr. Duquette is very engaged in writing and authorship. He has a lot of fantastic books that I know are available on Amazon. And uh, we will speak a little bit about another text relative to that one later. But I just want to say, Mr. Duquette, thank you so much for being here. If you're willing, would you introduce yourself? My name is Lon Milo Duquette, and uh, I'm a 72-year-old Southern California hippie. <laughs> and uh, yes, I've been interested in uh, sort of the Western mystery traditions since uh, since the 60s and uh, the psychedelic revolution and and uh, I toyed around for a few years with Eastern mysticism and I absolutely fell in love with Eastern mysticism but uh, <clears throat> it seemed like I wasn't hardwired well for the, the Eastern temperament and I uh, was sort of looking for something uh, comparable in the West and with the, with the Western sort of hardware psyche, uh, comparable to the Tao Te Ching. Hmm. And uh, believe it or not, uh, I stumbled across the Sefer Yed Zyra and something resonated with me with the Sefer Yed Zyra. Uh, it may be hard for you to picture this, but uh, it seemed to me like, uh, wow, this is kind of 180 degrees away from how uh, Eastern mysticism uh, approaches uh, illumination, but 180 degrees aimed at the same object. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes if that makes sense, uh, the object being. Uh, uh, the destruction of both uh, the target and what, what you're and who's aiming at it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, and the the Western, the the Hermetic, uh, uh, I'll say Kabbalah. Okay, I've been calling it Kabbalah for years. Mm -hmm. I'm so I don't give a shit. Uh, <laughs> so I invented a rabbi. Uh, who uh, says things like there is no such thing as Greek Hebrew pronunciation, so don't worry about it. And uh, but anyway, so that got me into uh, uh, other Western uh, traditions, practical uh, occultism, operative occultism, if you will, ceremonial magic, things like that. Right. And uh, I was fortunate enough, just early in my studies. Uh, to come into personal contact with uh, uh, three individuals who were uh, students of Aleister Crowley, contemporaries and students of Aleister Crowley, uh, who uh, were uh, happy to disabuse me of all of the, or, or many of the, the terrible rumors that you hear about Aleister Crowley, you know, they could actually say when I asked them, did he really eat babies, you know, <laughs> and uh, they could they could comfort me by saying, no, he didn't eat babies, you know. But I always I always thought that was a joke about the cakes of light, though. <laughs> well, even the, the yeah, every joke about the cakes of light is another is another mis, uh, misunderstanding. Of course. But, but anyway, Crowley would have just been thrilled over the misunderstandings. 
that's just how his humor was. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, people waste years uh, of their learning curve in uh, modern ceremonial magic and and the Western uh, practical occultism. Uh, hmm. I uh, uh, fearing and being freaked out and having to uh, having to dig and redig and redig and redig uh, to uh, dis abuse themselves of ridiculous rumors when uh, it would have just been easy if they could have just asked somebody if that was <laughs> is that really true no that's not really true you know he did a lot of weird things but so do uh so do modern people you know but he never did anything that weird oh yeah well we still have that same problem today nothing's changed <laughs> but but anyway i was very fortunate to uh uh uh, meet up and get to know and uh, uh, literally work with uh, uh, Israel Regardi. Uh, oh, wow. Phyllis Seckler and Grady McMurtry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so again, it was just blind luck. Believe me, I don't, I don't have a plan. I've never, I, I don't have a goal. Mm -hmm. I don't set out to do anything. I am too lazy to <laughs> to uh, plan ahead or try to do anything. I'm I'm a simple guy who just all my life has uh, stumbled from microsecond to microsecond, just uh, doing what appears to be the only thing that I can do from moment to moment. Well what, and, uh, what's funny though is as a man with no goal you are a very good teacher <laughs> and it's it's that, it caught me off guard not to say that i wasn't expecting you to be that's not what i mean it's just that when you see someone who's a really great teacher it tends to like strike at you you know uh which right really quickly i think now's a good time to mention that uh mr robbie lemon ben clifford otherwise known as Lon Milo Duquette, is doing talks regularly through Facebook, and I'll have a general link to that because he does it. It's almost daily, right? It is daily. It's every day since the pandemic. Well, and, and your readings yeah. are great, you know? Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm reading through uh, all my books. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I also, I mean, I know we, we do have a formal discussion, but just for the sake of it, uh, your, your talk today on the the self creation of magical implements, I believe not only with the Golden Dawn agree with that, but in my own life, you know, I tend to gravitate towards making my own things. I don't, I don't. It's it builds a certain level of uh, connection to an object, and, and and it's not to say it's purely materialistic, but it, it serves a greater role. You know, it it has a purpose before it's even used as a tool. And I appreciate that intimacy, if that's the correct word. Well, the you make the magic in it, you know. Uh, hardly anybody makes their own golf clubs, okay. <laughs> uh, but very often, uh, a golfer will uh, just fall in love with a particular putter, <laughs> or or. Usually it's a putter, uh, and and use it year after year after year after year after year, and year after year the golfer does miracles with that putter. Okay, mm. he does real magic with that putter, and uh, even though he didn't actually manufacture it or fabricate it himself, uh, after twenty or thirty years that putter is imbued with magic it's a wand uh, uh, the same thing with with magical implements uh, the there's beautiful crafts uh nowadays you can go on the internet and see sort of a uh, occult craft store and see all sorts of beautiful wands and 
swords and daggers and and discs and and chalices and things and they're great right. they're they're beautiful and i i love the uh the artistry of that uh of spiritual object darts you know mm -hmm. but um the real magician was the person that made them, <laughs> made them, <laughs> you know, uh, because all artists are magicians, and all magicians, if they're really magicians, are are artists. Magic is an art, uh, and uh, as well as a science, I guess. Mm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and that's another thing. I'm 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 lazy for. Uh, all my life, I've been really poor too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was just not cut out for objective reality, and I think in school you might have you might have uh, they might have diagnosed me with uh, attention deficit disorder, right? Back, back in the old days, you know, because I was a class clown, I was disruptive. Uh, uh, but in a good way, in a funny way, you know, I, I, I was a lovable <laughs> class clown. Uh, and, uh, but uh, something that I really like, though, I just turned my complete attention to and, and, uh, and it didn't even seem like I was mastering something, you know, it's just, wow, this is so cool, man. And one of those things was music. And, oh, okay. And uh, uh, I was, once again, I was lucky that in high school, uh, the vocal music director in town had the power of a winning football coach. And uh, he won all the state contests in vocal music and uh, uh, musicals, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he discovered me, I guess you'd say, uh, in the uh, sixth grade. And uh, he'd come and pluck me out of the sixth grade and take me to the high school so I could play the kids' roles in musicals and things like that. Okay. <laughs> and so all the other teachers wouldn't dare flunk me. I get it. Because <laughs> Because he needs this kid, okay, <laughs> and and uh, and I was shameless in rubbing their noses in it. I, you know, I never took a book home in in high school anyway. Never took a book home. Never passed a test, um, and uh, but I always got a C plus, you know, average, so I could uh, be Harold Hill next year, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but the idea that, that, uh, I can only be truly focused when it's something that is, uh, uh consuming me, uh, I guess makes, uh, a pretty good recipe for occult studies. I believe it does. Because yeah. I think esotericism and occultism really does take over in a way. It, it becomes a forefront of how we think. I mean, I, I mean, I get that. You know, when I really discovered, for example, like Zoharic things, uh, when I step into like the Thelemic studies, which is something that's more new to me, uh, it is uh, an obsession. <laughs> it is a good way to put it. It's almost obsessive by nature. So I get it, you know. And I appreciate that you have that same connection, you know, even though I, I think people tend to look at occultism very objectively. They, they want to just make it uh, very cut and dry and by and essentially make it this scientific approach, which we see in like the, these chaos styles that are far newer. But what always caught my attention is your sociable interaction with the information. I, I know we haven't really gotten into the text to talk about it. Um, chicken cobbler, but you, you have a comedic flair to what you do. And I think you're very well known for that. And it's pretty evident in the entirety of the work. I mean, even the title explained pretty early in is almost this 
this jokey approach to the material, but at the same time, you still give the material a lot of attention in terms of its details, you know? Uh, especially me swinging far more to the Jewish side just in my personal ideas, it's still awesome to see this this interconnectivity that can occur just by fusing the two together. Uh, which, if you want to talk about the work, I have to ask, why metaphysics? What was it about the metaphysics? Because in your rants, uh, in the, the first main chapter for the body of the text, the rants and uh, the development of the tarot and everything, you really spend a lot of time just talking about the metaphysical aspects of the Jewish Kabbalah. And it does help branch into a lot of these practices, specifically the tarot section. But it was also just like, I was wondering to myself, it's not that it's improperly related, but this looks like meditative work. This looks like meditative work. Like, what are, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, you don't have to tell these people that, but you did, you know, and... and I don't know. Uh, was there was there like a phase, you know, for the development of Robbie Lamed Ben Clifford as this characterization? Was there like a phase where you were just really into the metaphysical aspects, or do you feel that there's a certain connection between that and magical workings beyond just let's say correspondences? Yeah, right. Well, I uh, the simple answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, or at least I've never looked at it that way. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, remember, I uh, mentioned a minute ago about, uh, you know, kind of how a, a bell rang with me uh, when I first was introduced to the Tao Te Ching. Mm -hmm. it, that's when it occurred to me, uh, not because I made any sort of uh, Ruachian intellectual, uh, I didn't reason out the, the process uh, in order to d discover or to realize or to awaken to the fact that everything is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything is consciousness. And so the the it's almost like I worked backwards. <laughs> okay. The bell rang first. And then I was curious as to <laughs> as to the the technology of what's making the bell peal. Okay. Okay. And uh, so uh, I guess that's sort of how I, I uh, work with the Kabbalah. I, I uh, it, it's like you know, you walk into an art gallery and you see a, a a painting, and you're immediately elevated. Uh, your consciousness is immediately uh, stimulated, awakened by. Uh, uh viewing this piece of art mm -hmm. and uh once your consciousness has changed in a sense you have mutated yourself and now you're a different person and it's that different person that then that then almost in my leisure uh comes down enough to analyze you know what has just uh, what has just gone on there, and uh, uh, I'm really lucky that that over the years I've been put in a position uh, where I've uh, been obliged uh, to do some level of teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I have had. Uh, I've been chartered a lodge of OTO since 1977, uh, 78. And, uh, and we've always run the lodge out of our house. <laughs> uh, That's awesome, yeah. though. That's really cool. I mean, it, I have to tell you something. I have to be honest with you. In the same way that you have chicken cobblists, I am a fan and friend of the Quailamites. It's a totally different thing. We started it only a few months ago as a joke. 
but it has a lot of steam and I'm a little worried about it right now. <laughs> um, it's uh, for those who don't understand it, when you read the work, prefer, I really hope that you do go and get this book, Chicken Cobbler by Mr. Duquette, because it, it's a phenomenal piece, but the chicken cobblest is an understanding of a certain type of person who deals with these matters, but is not necessarily having to fit all these prior expectations, all these regulations and rules, which in a way fits into the Thelemic doctrine. Now we do have some people like me who tend to be way more leaning into the kosher spheres. However, I still talk about Thelema and I still find it interesting. So we have Quailamites. And you can be a Thelemite and a Quailamite. You cannot be a Thelemite and be a Quailamite, but a Quailamite is not necessarily a Thelemite. <laughs> and Rabbi Ben Clifford would say, don't worry about it. Exactly. Don't oh. even worry about it. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, the uh, we don't know what we know until somebody asks us a question. Mm. I know this sounds weird. It, no, it, it makes perfect sense. I uh, totally get that. I don't know who it was uh, one of the quantum physicists or something. It might have been uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, he said uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we don't we don't, uh, or, or the answer reveals itself in the, in the questions that we ask, right? Or, or words to that effect, and uh, so the the we are so close to ourselves as uh, monads, as as temporary centers of consciousness. We're so close to ourselves that we don't notice ourselves growing. We don't notice ourselves mutating. Uh, only in retrospect have I uh, uh, observed that uh, uh, Kabbalistic uh, uh, exercises, uh, 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 meditations on the, the Hebrew alphabet, the uh, uh, creation of space time, and uh, uh, and all of those really sort of left hemisphere Ruachian uh, things, uh, you don't think your way into that, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and for years, uh, of course, when I, I was a student of Phyllis Seckler, and for years I did the standard operating procedure of fledgling magicians, mm -hmm. the Hebrew alphabet, you know, the correspondences with the uh, Sefer Yet Zyra, uh, uh, leading into the the imagery of the tarot and the, the you know, the correspondences and, and the, the filing cabinet of everything. I didn't know right. what the hell I was doing any of that for. Okay, hmm. but I didn't know that even in my confusion as I was studying it, I was, I was reconstructing how I thought about things. You know, Plato, uh, you know, uh, says there's worlds behind worlds behind worlds behind worlds. And when Plato says it, you go, hey, well, Okay, it's, <laughs> it's very Greeky, you know, but uh, this idea that everything is connected to everything else, everything is the pattern for everything else, everything is a reflection uh, for everything else, just working with it, even, even to the degree of, oh, I'm going to have to kind of prove up like, uh, like a pop quiz for my teacher. <laughs> it mutates you and when you're mutated you don't know you don't recognize the fact that you've just been mutated because the machinery of your perception has changed along with your mutation right okay. 
So it takes an outside influence. It needs an outside mirror for you to look in and finally say, oh, I've grown a new nose. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't First know. of all, I hope you did it. <laughs> and uh, so we opened up our, our house once a week for a, for a magic class because I just felt obliged to do that as part of my lodge master thing. Right. And, and I never presume to be a teacher. I just, it's everything is a is a workshop. I'm learning this with you. Mm. And I'll, I'll tell you where we can jump off from what I think I already know. See, again, uh, your, your infamous humility is not bad. I really, really appreciate it. I really oh. do. But well, anyway, people will ask me a question and I had no idea. <laughs> All of a sudden I go, Whoa, what a good question. And all of a sudden, all of those little things that I've practiced and learned in the last you know, 50 years all reshuffle themselves like old fashioned computer punch cards. Right. You know, back there. And I explain it to myself, and the student listens as I explain it to myself for the first time. <laughs> and it appears that, you know, I've had, a, I've already, well, yes, I've already, I've always known it, but I've been too lazy, to, <laughs> <laughs> too lazy to accept the fact that I knew it, you know, and, uh, uh, and that even the act of doing that compounds the mutation and tucks that away quite nicely in my new mutated uh soul if you will right so uh uh yeah don't discount the fact that uh uh it's very helpful to open yourself up to people asking you questions uh if you don't lead them to to believe that, <laughs> that, you, that you have any answers. <laughs> well, that's actually, that's, it's it immensely enlightening. It's one of those things that I feel like we don't talk about a whole lot in occultism. I think we do get wrapped up on details. You mentioned many students coming to talk about correspondences and, and essential practice tips and things like that. And I think that's kind of in a way, it's almost the bane of the teacher, but also the blessing of the teachers. The, the regurgitation is reinforcing, you know, and it's propagating itself. They will likely satisfy and fulfill that same space later on, you know. It, I have to say, though, 